All right, so we were talking about numerical methods. Uh, we we're dealing with data last time. And basically, it narrowed down to two things. We had some data, and we could either convert it to some equation to work with, or we could work with data. And much in the same way, we can do calculus with data. And with calculus, right, you basically got derivatives and integrals. And that's what we're going to go over now. So similar manner, we can do it with equations. We can convert this to equation, which is a symbolic in MATLAB, right? And then with that symbolic, we can integrate or differentiate. But we can also just take the data and do numerical integration and differentiation. So as a quick review, let's look at this first process. So let's say we have some data and to say data is rand of one five is a hundred and t is one to five. So we do a polyfit of t beta and let's say fourth or let's just do three. So then if I plot my t data and my T polyval, I say this is my polynomial of polynomial and T and dashed. So does this do what I'm thinking of? Yeah, it looks like it. So I've got my polynomial equation that's got this random data that it's working with. And I could just have this be an actual equation. So let's say this is the XP of, of T, and then we got some randomness in there. Let's see how much randomness that is. Uh, not a ton. amp this up a little bit. There we go. So in any case, this is our uh, polynomial fitting our data. And we can see it matches pretty well. We could then do diff of, we could do something pretty fancy here and make it so our equation is, and we'll do a poly to sim. And if I look that up, poly to sim, it creates a symbolic polynomial from a vector of coefficients. So we got our vector of coefficients here. So we feed that in polynomial. And I could see what this actually does. If I do poly to sim of polynomial. There we go, it'll convert it to fractions here, but it gives us a symbolic from a set of coefficients because if I look up polynomial, then if I do this, take out my X, that is the 112.17. So I could work this out polynomial of one times x and do sims of x or maybe t let's do x so that we still can keep our t but polynomial one times x and then do that 
go to x cubed and then plus polynomial 2 times x squared and do that with writing it out myself but uh, that will not work all of a sudden if I just want to change this if I just want to make it linear all of a sudden I'd have to go back and rewrite this to match so to make this more generalized I can do poly to sim of my polynomial and then I don't need this I can just say diff of equation and I'll get my derivative and I could get my integral is the int of equation. And there we go. So we would expect uh, we'll get three times this big thing. Uh, so x squared. And then we should get x to the fourth for our integral. And of course, it will ignore the constant there. It'll just assume it's zero. But we could add that as well if we knew what that was. So there we are. That's how we can accomplish this symbolically, right? Derivative or integral, pretty simple. But there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to convert your data to a curve, uh, some of which we talked about before, but just there's a lot of information lost. Maybe you don't know what curve fits. Maybe it's just such a long string of data that uh, you can't really well fit a curve to it. You could maybe fit several curves or something like that. But uh, then you have breakpoints, right, where you have multiple sets of equations. So there are many reasons you wouldn't want to go with that. And you could just go the numeric route. So how does numeric work? Well, numerical. Let's say you're trying to find the derivative and you have some equation, right? How did we find the derivative when we first found out how to do derivatives? Well, we wanted to find the derivative at some point, and we know the derivative is the slope, it's the dy over the dx, but we'd use some equation like uh, limit as a approaches zero of f of x, plus a minus f x over a, right? And that would find the f of x and then some a step away that point and find the slope there. And then as you get closer and closer, you can approximate this point with it better and better until you finally get to a is zero. And then you can calculate the true derivative with that, right? So. We know we can do that, but in this case, we can get the exact slope at that point by using uh, a limit. But when you only have a limited number of points, you cannot get closer and closer, right? These are the two closest points you've got. And usually they're evenly spaced, though not always. For the situation, we'll assume they're evenly spaced. So to find the derivative at this point, I could do something kind of similar to this, right? I could do this, the slope with that far point, then I could go to this point and do that. But now I don't have any points closer. I can't approach zero anymore because once I get to this actual point, I just have one point and I don't know what that slope is. So I have to work with the points closest to me. So there are three ways that you can approximate the derivative at this point commonly. So that is using a forward derivative, calculating the slope with the next point. There's using a backwards derivative, calculating the slope with a previous point, and center derivative. The center difference is just ignoring this point. What's the slope between the points before and after? And uh, where I say derivative, you, you can go this forward difference, backwards difference, and center difference. So you could guess if this is uh, A, B, C, you could figure out all these yourself, but let's just write them out here. And what we'll do here 
is we'll say the first one, second one, and third one. The first is forward difference. So this will be f of c minus f of b will be the middle. And this divided by c minus b, right? That's how we could calculate dy dx between these two points. Second, I can do a backward difference. This would be f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. And finally, center difference. And that's f of c minus f of a divided by c minus a. And there we go. So this is how we can actually calculate the derivative at this point right here. And often, what we'll actually choose is the center difference. This one we like the most because, as you could guess from, let's say, this point, if you look right here, you'll get this is your slope, which is pretty close, but not the closest. If you look right here, you get this is your slope. But if you look right here, you'll actually get quite a close approximation of the slope at this point. So in using the sort of the average of these two, the forward and backwards, you can get the center, which is often quite a good approximation of the derivative at that center point. But um, there are limitations with each of these, right? So for these limitations, forward can't, uh, let's see, can't the endpoint can't calculate the forward derivative because there's no point out here to calculate it with. So can't be done on last point. Uh, for the limitation for this backward difference, as you might guess, it can't be done on this first point, right? It can be done on everything else. It can be done on this point. It can be done on this point, this point. But for this far rear one, it can't be done. So can't be done on first point. And center difference, uh, unfortunately, can't be done on either the first or the last point because we need a point before and after. So at the first one, we don't have a point before. The last one, we don't have a point after. So it can't be done on first or last. So we have kind of a smart way of doing this. And the way we typically want to calculate this is we like the center difference the most, right? That's if we could choose. Often that's the best approximation, so we go with center difference. However, that one's the one that's most limited, right? Because it can't be done on the first or the last point. So what we're going to do typically is we're going to want to, on every point besides the first and last, do center difference. And then on the very first and the very last, we'll use the forward and backwards difference, whichever one works for that case. So the forward difference for the first and backwards difference for the last. So that's often the most preferred way of doing it. We could, for every point but the last, do a forward difference. We could, for every point but the first, do a backwards difference. But we really like center difference. As we saw, it, it does a really good job of approximating that derivative. So we want center difference everywhere we can, and then forward and backwards where we cannot. So that's a useful method of calculating the derivative numerically. And we'll hop into MATLAB and see exactly how we can do this and go from there. So numerically, we'll work with the same 
data, so I won't do a clear. But for our difference, if I pull this up, let's say I wanted to do a forward difference. So to do the forward at a specific point, let's say we just want to calculate it at one point for now. So forward difference, and we'll define a T, let's call it T cared about. And this is the oh, size of T is one by 91. Let's say we care about the 50th T. Okay, then we want to calculate the forward difference at that 50th T. Well, we can say the position is 50. And then the t cared about is that t at the position. So the forward difference would be f of c, which is the data at our point ahead of us. So our position plus 1 minus the data at our position. So data at position. And then all of this divided by the position plus 1 minus the position or the t at the position plus 1 minus t at the position. OK, so this is our forward diff. Our center difference is very similar, except instead of uh, at b, it's at a. So it's the same for the first on the numerator and the denominator, but we're going to have one backwards for the center for the subtraction there. Now I can do backwards difference, and that'll be the data at the position minus the data at the position minus 1, then the t at the position minus the t at the position minus 1. So. I can calculate all of those. And for my t cared about 5.9, that's the 50th in t. So I'm looking at the slope looking forward. And if I pull up my plot and zoom in a bit here to 5.9, 5.9. Nine. So right here is where I'm working with. And we can see right here, I've got my slope uh, for the forward derivative. Right here is for the backward derivative. And then if I did a hold on and plotted the center derivative, which would be t of position minus 1, t of position plus 1, and then a y of data of position minus 1 and data of position plus 1. Then let's make it red. Plot that. That's our center derivative. So we can sort of see we expect our forward derivative difference to be the most, right? Backward difference to be the least and center difference to be in the middle. So you could by hand calculate all this out, but we won't go through that now. Um, we'll just see that here I've got a forward difference that's the greatest, center difference second most, and backwards difference the least. And you can sort of see how it would make sense to go for the center difference in this case. So. That's how we can do forward, center, and backwards difference at any point. And some of you may have noticed by now that the forward difference and the backward difference are going to be the same for different points. Meaning, at this point, the forward difference is the slope of this line. At this point, the backwards difference is the slope of this line. So they're exactly the same, right? Um, and that's not a problem or anything. That's just, that's how it's going to work. Um, and center difference, of course, is not often it's going to be the safest bet for the most accurate. All right, so 
That's the forward difference, center difference, and backwards difference at a single point. Let's look at all of the points. All right, so in trying to calculate the forward center and backwards difference for each of the points, I'll just go through and do the forward difference. And you could apply this to the center and backwards difference as well. So for the forward, I'm going to say I want to go through each point in T. So I want to go from one to length of T. Oops, not T cared about, just T. And if it ever does this, I always just press escape a bunch of times in order to uh, not do that. You only need to do it once, but I just smashed the escape key. Anyways, uh, for one to length of T, I want to say for word diff of, I'll make this variable N. That's just the position I'm working at. So the derivative at that N is going to be the forward. So it'll be data at n plus 1 minus data n. And this divided by t at n, or t at n plus 1 minus t at n. Because I've got forward difference being, if I'm starting right here, I've got this is 1 we'll say for simplicity, or at least is the first point. So data at that next point, n plus one, minus data at that point, n, over t at the next point, n plus one, minus t at n. And that's my forward derivative. So when I end this, I can run this, but I'll run into a little bit of a problem, you'll see. So index exceeds the number of array elements. Index must not exceed 91. So when I did this, I went from one to length of t. And I'm looking at t of length of t plus 1 at the final 1, right? So because we can't calculate the forward difference at this last point, I can't calculate the forward difference at this last point. So I'll only go to the second to last point. And then what I'll have to do is at that last point and just say not a number because it's not really defined. I could either say it's the backwards difference or I could just give it not a number. And this is an example of where you could use not a number and it'd be pretty useful. So now if I run this, I get my forward difference. And my length of forward difference, 1 by 91 double, which is the same size as my t. So I was able to make a derivative, even though I had to spoof the size with the uh, not a number. I can now easily just plot the data. So I can say plot of t and data, and then hold on, plot. I'll just make a new figure here to keep the old figure. Plot of t forward diff. Say that and run. So now I've got my blue line is the original, and I could add my legend here legend. Uh, the first is my data. Second is forward diff. Run that here. And I got my data and my forward diff. And uh, you need to use a slash here before the underscore. Otherwise, it would make it a subscript. So forward diff. And there we go. So that's the derivative. You can see it's high here because the slope is pretty high, right? But the slope keeps changing, so it's spiking up and down. But let's look right here. At the very first point, we have a negative. Let me turn grid on for ease here. So this is my 0. I'll plot t of 0, t of length of t. So I'll just plot a line along the horizontal that's 
black make this easier p of one there we go that's the problem so i've got my horizontal line there so we can see it's going down and so we have this negative and the negative is lesser at this point right for that slope and then right about here we get to the zero point so yeah pretty good approximation right about here is zero not too bad right about here we got zero so yeah we can see our derivative of our data right with our data and we didn't have to convert it to a polynomial we didn't need a polynomial that fit this well we could just with the numerical data here and as you can notice here with our little bit of noise um, taking the derivative seemed to sort of amplify the noise and that is the case uh, when you're working with numerical data often you want to smooth it out or uh, sample the data so that you can have it be less noisy because when you're taking the derivative it does add a lot of noise uh, and the integral actually takes out a lot of noise so thing to keep in mind when you're taking the numerical derivative or integral so there we go we made our forward derivative and i'll leave the center and backward differences to you you could make your own function to do this and then you could call up whenever you wanted to that function and give it the uh, x and the y. And I could show you that real quick. So if I make my function and to remind us, if you forget, you can make a new function and this is how it's defined, right? Whoops. Yeah, function your output, which in this case will be my derivative forward equals forward diff. That's what I'll just call my function. I'll call it forward derivative to not match exactly this name. So forward derivative, and then I'll give it my T and data, or I could just say X and Y for simplicity. So I got my comment here. This is my function name forward derivative. And this is the summary. This is the detail. So calculates the forward derivative of the data x, y. Then I could get my detailed explanation. Calculates the forward derivative defined by f of x plus 1 minus f of x divided by x t of x plus 1 or so I should say n not use x in this case f of n plus 1 or t of n plus 1 x here minus x of n ranging through the ends from 0 to length of x minus 1, or from uh, 1 to length of x minus 1. And I could probably just say y here to explain this the best. And then the forward derivative at length of x will be not a number. Okay, so there we go. We got our function with our output, the inputs, the explanation, and then I could just put this in here and clean it up. For n is one of the length, this will be x, this will be y, y, x, x, and length. X. So now 
if I save this in my whatever folder you've got for your functions, I'll just go into MATLAB and my functions where I've added to the path. And now I can do forward derivative of data. Oh, I of course need to do T and data. And there we go. Final point, not a number. And if I pull up forward diff, it looks exactly the same because it is exactly the same. So that's how we could calculate all of those and put it in a function to use later. Perfect. Um, we plotted it. So that is that. Now, of course, you're not the first person to need to do the forward center backwards differences. So MATLAB comes with a function that does this for you. So it is important to know how to do this. If you're not using MATLAB, then you're going to need to know how to code this yourself. And it's really valuable to know in the background what exactly it's doing. So that, you know, like with the derivative here, it really does make a big difference if you understand what's going on. You can understand why the derivative would cause this excess noise, whereas the integral would somewhat uh, mediate the noise. So yeah, it is very useful, but there is a built-in tool, built-in MATLAB tool to do the differences, and that is called gradient. So if I pull up the doc for gradient, and you can see here, it does what we were talking about earlier with center difference everywhere it can and backwards and forwards where it can't. fx equals gradient of f. And gradient of f, it takes in the data effectively here. And then it assumes the spacing between points is 1. So uh, we could also do f and h and h is the uniform spacing between points in each direction. So in our case, the spacing isn't one on the x, it's 0.1. So we would need to specify in here data and 0.1. And if I were to plot this with t and gradient, and let's make it green and dashed when I run this and pull up oops my figure here oh not figure one i want last figure so here we are you can see the orange and the green match a lot in the trend uh it just says data one because i didn't define but we know the green dashed is our center difference but you can see how it's kind of where i've got like a zero slope if I drew the black line again here uh, zero slope is like right here which is closest on the center difference than it is on the forward difference right because it just sort of went from negative right here to positive right here and it doesn't account for this negative being more or less than this positive so this positive to this positive uh, center difference sort of takes the average of those, but forward just looks at this one. So center difference often gives you, as we mentioned, the best results. And so what gradient does is it does the center difference for every point, except we know we can't do the center difference at the first or the last point. So what it does is it automatically does the forward difference at the first point right here you can see it's exactly the same as the forward difference at the first point, and it's exactly equal to the backwards difference at the final point. So forward difference doesn't, it has a not a number at the final point because you can't define the forward difference there, but the backwards difference at the final point is the same as the forward difference at the previous point. So we get the same derivative actually as this point right here, result from the gradient. So pretty nice that MATLAB comes built in with that, but you could easily swap up this function to be one to length of X. And then if you're at one, 
then you do forward difference. If you're at the end length of x, then do backwards difference. Otherwise, do center difference, and that would do exactly what gradient does. You could also, if I pull up the doc again, you can do more fancy stuff with this, but that's what we'll keep with for now. So there you go. That's derivatives using it numerically in MATLAB, just like we did it symbolically right up here. So let's actually do a quick compare of, help if I can spell there. Uh, let's do a quick compare of this derivative versus the center difference to sort of see how this is working. So I'll, I'll close all and I'll plot the original data. So T and data, hold on. And then I'll plot the T and my derivative is symbolic, whoops, derivative. I'll have to run this because I changed the name, or derivative, nope, gamma. Invalid expression, line 57, of course, it's just not finished yet. So come back here, run it again. And I've got my derivative now. So I've spelled it right. And with symbolics, we can do a subs into derivative with specifying the x sim of x. And I want to substitute into that t a matrix, and this will be my symbolic, there we go, symbolic derivative equals subs into that, but we want it to be a double, so we convert this to a double, and there we are. So this is the points using a polyfit, converting that to a symbolic and taking the derivative. I'll put this into my code up above. Oops. Symbolic derivative. So now I'll plot t versus this symbolic derivative. And I'll make it dashed and red. Or I'll make it, yeah, yeah, let's say dashed and red. Um, then I will plot t versus gradient of data 0.1. And I'll make it dotted and green. Okay, let's see if I did any mistakes here. So legend, this would be the data, the symbolic, and the numerical. All right, looks like no mistakes there. So red is the derivative of the polynomial that we made, right? The symbolic. Blue is our data and green is our numerical. So we've seen both of those, but plotting this data here, you can see sort of where that would come from, right? If it's got this polynomial fit, it'll make a pretty smooth, easy derivative as well there, which seems to match sort of like our numerical derivative, right? But because of course, in this, we've got lots of rapid changes, the polyfit won't incorporate any of that, which may or may not be what we're looking for. If we want just the data to be represented very simply by a polynomial, and we know that it will represent it accurately, so if we know that all of this is noise, it's not actually accurate to the data, then maybe we want the polyfit with the symbolic derivative. But often, data doesn't fit super well to a a uh, simple polynomial like this. And so we do something like our numerical derivative here. So yeah, that's all those compared against each other. And now let's go into integrals. So for integrals is our derivative. Now, moving on for an integral, we know 
Definition of an integral is the area under the curve, right? So if we got the integral from 0 to a, if this is a, then this area right here is the integral, right? There we are. That's our integral. So if I wanted to do this uh, numerically, how might I do this? Well, a well, way we can approximate this is just using really close points together and drawing this little trapezoid to approximate the area under that one section. So if we added up each of these trapezoids together, then that would give us an approximate integral. That'll work pretty good. And indeed, this is similar to how you dr drive it symbolically. But we'll just look at it numerically for now. So to do this, uh, what we would do is if we want the first trapezoid, then we want basically the area of the triangle up here and the rectangle down here. So we'll do f of, and if we say this is a step of uh, d, let's say. So we'll do f of d minus f of 0 multiplied by d, and then 1 half of this, because our height is f at d minus f at 0. Our width is d, so base times height, and it's 1 half of that. So there we go. That's the triangle part right up here. All right, and then the rectangle here is f at 0 multiplied by d, because the height, f at 0, with d. So that we can use to apply to each of these trapezoids, right, to get the area there. But problem with this is, does it work when we go downward? Because this will work if we do upwards, but does this equation work if we are sloping downwards? So let's take a look at an example. Let's say this is sloping downwards. We got this trapezoid. Well, this area is this minus this, right? So that would look like f of 0. This is 0. This is d. f at 0 times d minus f of 0 minus f of d, because in this case, 0 is higher than d, and then multiplied by our d, and then 1 half. And as you can see, we're subtracting this, so we'll invert it, f of d minus f of 0, and then plus. So indeed, that is exactly the same as up above. So we can use this whether or not it's sloping down or sloping up. So this is our triangle, this is our rectangle. But we can use this to calculate exactly what... Uh, our integral is, or approximate our numeric integral. All right, and of note, how we had it with the derivative, right, is we had the three options, forward, center, and backwards. With integral, we don't have that so much because the integral is the past. So this trapezoid will be this point, this point, right here will be zero because there's nothing up to that point. So unlike derivative, you don't really have that variance here. And for example, for this point, you would just add up this trapezoid, this trapezoid, and this trapezoid, right, to get that. So let's head over to MATLAB and use this. All right, here we are. So let's first look at the integral of each of these points. So if I look here, of course, the integral at the first point would be zero, as we just said. But the integral at the second point, we could calculate real quick. So the integral at that second point would be, we look at our equation, integral point two would be which would be data of 2, because d in this case is 1 
forward and f of zero, this zero is the first position. So data of two minus data of one, and then this multiplied by the step there, which in our case is time of two minus, or t of two minus t of one, multiplied by one half, and then add to this data of one times time or t of two minus t of one. There we are. That should work. If we run this, we'll see the integral for our first point is 40.303. But unlike derivative, where you may be wanting to calculate the derivative at a single point, um, we usually don't want the single trapezoid at one point because with a integral, it's always, except for the very first one, the sum of all the previous trapezoids. So to make this very useful, we'll have to do a loop. We'll say for n is one to length of t. And if n is one, then we know integral is zero. And let's use a different name than what we used up here. So I'll say integral numeric is zero. And else, so for all the other points, we'll do this same thing. So we'll do integral at the n is data at n minus data at n minus one, because we're looking at this is n, this is n minus one, so this height minus this height times that step, which is t of two or t of n minus t of n minus one. And we could just do this in this as one value, but just in case we had data with a varying t, if this wasn't uh, incremented at exactly 0.1 each step, then we would want to make it this variable, not just say dt is t of two minus t of one, and then use the dt here. If that dt changed at all for each step, then this would still work. So I'll stick with this, and then I'll just divide by two, because I don't actually need to multiply by one, then divide by two, plus data of uh, n minus one times t of n minus t of n minus one. And because we're doing n minus one instead of n plus one, we will get to length of t and not reach past the limits. So we can calculate this and we won't run into any errors. I'll express this, but now we've got our, oh, I'm gonna do an integral numeric here as well. So we've got this computation, but this is just calculating this one trapezoid, right? Calculating this previous shape um, in order to get this point. But we want to add all the previous trapezoids. So we want to add the last step, integral numeric of n minus one. And because we only go if it's greater than one, then this will be okay. But yeah, there we have the full integral calculation numerically. And now we can use, there's just like there was a built-in function for derivative, there's a built-in function for trapezoids or integration that we can work with, and that's called traps. So here I spelled it out doc traps. And if I look it up here, traps computes the approximate integral of y via the trapezoidal method with unit spacing. And then you could, if it's not unit spacing, you can either give it an x and a y, or as it specifies here, if x is a scalar spacing, so it's just consistent, like in our case it's 0.1, then traps of x, y, you could make it set equal to x times traps of y, or just traps of x and y. So 
the way we can do this is traps of t and data, right? But this is just calculating the trapezoid. It's just that one shape again. And we want all the previous ones. So we would have to do 4n is 1 to length of t. Then we could say integral traps of n equals traps of t data. But we don't want just the trapezoid. We want the summation of all the previous ones, like we did with integral numeric. We want to say that the integral of traps of n is traps of t of 1 colon n and data of 1 colon n and the sum of that. Because then our integral is the summation of all of the trapezoids up to that point. But this won't quite work because if I run this, it'll say traps dimension argument must be a positive integer scalar within indexing range. So what it's doing here, why it's having a problem is because we start at n equals one. So we just feed it one point for t and data. And of course, you can't ca calculate the trapezoid at just this one point, right? Because it doesn't have anything to make a trapezoid. It's just one x and one y. It needs set of x's and y's. So I will now say if n equals one, then integral traps, traps of one is zero. So that's the integral at the first point. And then else, else it equals this. And when I run this, great. And if I pull up my integral numeric and we look at these final points, will they be the same? Yes. So if I were to plot t integral numeric, and give this red and t integral traps and give it green and dashed because it's over top. So I want it to be dashed if it perfectly overlays. I'll do a close all actually and then do this. So here we are, lines exactly overlap, right? Because it's exactly the same thing. Traps is doing exactly what we did before. So that's how you can compute the integral yourself numerically or use the MATLAB built-in function traps to do that. Yeah, so now let's see some results. So make a new figure, plot t in data. So we can see that and then hold on, plot t integral numeric. And I know it'll be the same as plot t integral traps, but we'll look at it in any case. And then I'll plot the symbolic. And if I look up here again, I can do the exact same thing as I was doing here before. Here, symbolic integral is double of subs and instead of derivative, I have integral sims of x and t. And if you remember, I accidentally overread some of integral before. So I'll first run this again. And then I can do this. But of course, I need to actually fill this in. t symbolic integral. And double substitute into integral, so that should work. Plot that. And give myself a legend here. Legend data. The numeric traps and symbolic. There we are. So if I do this one as dashed, of course. Then I can see my numeric and traps perfectly overlay. My symbolic is pretty close. My data, of course, is a different thing entirely. So it's just here for reference as to guessing the integral, because of course it'll ramp up because it's the sum of the area under the curve up to that point. So it 
will exponentially increase just as this exponentially increases. So, perfect, that's looking pretty good. And we could change some of the data here to see if we change certain things, how it changes it. I could say, for example, two times t plus exponent of t, and then let's add twice the error there or the noise then let's say i lower this to a second order polynomial see how this changes things so it doesn't fit near as well as two versus five right so five it's pretty straight on two it is not so good right so we'll see a lot more variance in the integral symbolically versus numerically and we can see exactly that so yeah there we are of course i could increase this i could make this a whole new plot i just do two times t and of course the noise is way too much in this case let's just make it zero for now and what happens to my numerical and symbolic then? They're almost exactly equal. Just slightly overlaid there. Slightly varied. So, perfect. That is how we can do that. And if we go back to more noise, do P of T, then when I run this, Remember how with the differential, we had a increase in noise. With this bit of noise here, uh, I increased the spikes, right? Because the change in a slope caused an even greater change in the derivative or the jittering up and down here uh, caused a bit of extremes with the derivatives because it's the derivative makes it more sensitive because it's analyzing the change. And because it's changing with high frequency here, the derivative is very, very noisy. Uh, the integral does the reverse, and as you can see, it's very smooth, despite this a little bit more noisy input here. So there we are. That's how you can do symbolic and numerical integrals in MATLAB. And of course, we could just apply this same numerical computation of integral to any programming language and find the integral of some data. So we were working with uh, data and either converting to a symbolic, some polynomial, or just using the data directly and like interpolating between points. Now we can work with the data and either use symbolics and stuff to do derivatives and integrals, or we can do it numerically. And there you are. Hope you learned a lot and thanks for watching.